One more time. Just one more time with John 15, 1 through 8. One more time we're going to read it together. Uh, if you would, please, um, let's read this together. All right? Read it with me. I am the vine, you are, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Uh, note to self, if you're ever leading people in reading something, make sure you read it correctly, right? <laughs> All right, we've been going through these seven necessities of life, seven biological necessities, and kind of applying them to this this passage and what it means to live in Christ and we've gone to this week we get to the last one which is very fitting excretion now that's just a polite way of saying something that we probably don't want to talk about in church right it's a, it's a hazardous subject and uh, there's so many things that can be said here I, I've restrained myself and I want you to know that if there are any puns that they are accidental okay and if there's any jokes it's accidental I just because it, I, I didn't want to joke about this it, there's just so many places you could go with it it's, it's an important subject I think that you'll see and it's important uh, on at least two different levels the first one excretion is necessary because without it we would die of toxins I think we know this I mean physically if our liver doesn't work, if our kidney doesn't, kidneys don't work, if they don't filter the blood, if our intestines aren't working correctly, we, we build up toxins, and it means death. Now, the fact is, is that little kids love to joke about this, right? I've got grandkids in our homes all the time. It's, it's just amazing, you know, how they'll say poopy, and they just think it's the most hilarious thing in the world. Right, and they know the mystery around this. They they know the mystery of the of the toxins, and it's just like you know, it's it's just so hilarious. So they say it, and they giggle, and the adults wonder what in the world is so funny about that. But we're sure glad that they're saying that word and not some other words that they could be using, right? But it's a fact of life that this has to take place, or we're going to die. And and I mean that's not that funny. And and like little children, who will kind of postpone this for as long as they can this, this always still drives me nuts a little kid you'll say go to the bathroom and no I don't need to go well you're doing a dance in the yard go to the bathroom like I'll never have to go again right Th that'll be it I'll never go I'll, I'll never take the time to go but in the same way we kind of you know postpone talking about this subject because we we don't want to give some things up toxic things that harm us and uh, we like to hold on to them. And the same way that our, our bodies uh, eliminate the toxins of waste, um, our hearts and minds have to intentionally uh, get rid of the toxins or they kill us. And, and really, we accumulate a lot of stuff, some waste, just as a natural part of being human. There's no way you can get around it. It's just like being, being physical and getting toxins. In the same way, spiritually, we get all kinds of toxins in our lives because we live in a world that we often get what we don't deserve. And the, the right thing doesn't always happen to us. And sometimes we do good things and bad things happen. And they got just kind of stick to us and they pile up in, in our hearts and our minds. So, so there has to be excretion. I once gave a sermon, um, probably 10 years ago, uh, where I 
brought my great big backpack, my not little backpack, but my big backpacking, hiking backpack to worship and got it out in the middle of the floor out here, chancel we called it at that time. And I was speaking about the necessity of letting go like today and stopping uh, practice of carrying things around and um, things that are really too heavy for us. So I had this big backpack and I put these rocks in the backpack and each rock had something written on the rock and that was the illustration. And there were words on the first rocks I pulled out words like fat and stupid and lazy or loser or ugly and slow and you know as I said the, these are the the rocks these are the words that are said to us when we're little kids you know you just hang around some third or fourth graders and wow they can be brutal to each other you know and uh, they see a little flaw in some kid and they just jump on it and I mean, they're just just malicious sometimes and and so we all go through that because everybody has some words everybody has some rocks and and you know still we you know may get up in the morning and look in the mirror and you know that word's still there you know and we we do what we can but it's just being whispered and then some of the rocks that I had in there were uh, sentences a sentence is like uh, you, you'll never be as good as your brother you know or I regret marrying you and uh, another rock had a sentence like you're fired and another one said if you had been a better daughter we wouldn't have gotten divorced and those sentences of course were said by somebody else we didn't do that ourselves but uh, man it's almost impossible uh, to uh, carry that around they're, they're just really extremely heavy things to have in your backpack and uh, anybody that's got those things in there is going to suffer some kind of disability you know that's just too much and then then I had some rocks with with one word or a phrase on it uh, that represented an event that happened in in life and things like you know death of a mother or a car accident uh, another rock had like DUI on it another rock had uh, suicide another rock had abortion on it another rock had you know abuse another rock had incest rape bankruptcy stuff like that and I had all those rocks in that backpack and you could hardly pick the backpack up it was just too much stuff and powerful events for us to carry around with us and of course the point was that we all have backpacks everybody's got a backpack and we all have all kinds of rocks that are put in there and some of them we put in ourselves and some of them are put in by other people um, but the rocks are so many and the backpacks get heavy and the thing is is that after a while we get used to the weight the, the weight you know they just get put in one at a time and and we were able to carry the backpack we still are trying to walk around and may, maybe we might have to have a cane or something or a crutch to walk with you know something like you know bourbon at night or a little weed in the morning or you know some some pills during the day uh, something like that but we, we actually function in life with these backpacks and forget that they're still there they just kind of fuse to us we we forget that those things are there and the rocks become our identity and we become the rocks and, and we and we think man this this is life this is all that there is is carrying this thing around with me everywhere I go because we begin to compensate, you know, we, we, we lean over a little bit and, and then we, we compensate with things like bitterness and, and resentment and uh, self-pity or, you know, blaming somebody or, or unforgiveness. And we begin to think that, that this is normal, that this is what life is. It's all this stuff, you know, that we're carrying around. We think, we become apathetic become angry and I mean a lot of people just stop caring and hoping the scripture that day was Matthew 11 28 to 30 it's one that we're very familiar with here where Jesus says come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest and take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I'm gentle and humble in heart you will find rest for your souls and verse 30 he says take my yoke is easy my burden is light and that was what I was going off of. 
And Jesus, in essence, not just there, but in many different places, he says, hey, all those rocks that you've got, all those rocks were thrown at me. Uh, that, that, that rock that, that, you know, says suicide. Somebody threw that rock at me and, and he became ugly and he became fat and he became slow and he became dumb. He became the least of us, is what he says. And he failed at parenting and he failed at marriage and he failed at business and he became the worst of us. But he says, but I picked up your backpacks. And he said, this is the end of the sermon. And he goes, wow, don't you wish you were there? He, he says to us, he says, let me carry that for you. You don't need to carry that backpack anymore. I'll carry that backpack. I've got this, man. Just, just walk here with me. I can handle this, you see. And you don't, you don't have to, to hang your head. You don't, you don't need that cane that you've had anymore. You know, you can throw that thing away. I've got this. These rocks are going to kill you. Let them kill me. It's a good sermon. You should have been there. It's really a good sermon. I wish you'd been there. The point is, we can't live with the toxins. I mean, we have to let them go. And that's, that's just a crucial part of what it means in, the, in Scripture where he says to live in Christ, to live in Him. The past is gone. Our old life is gone. All of the rocks are gone. And we give our lives to Christ. We accept His sacrifice for us. We accept what He did to be sufficient for us. And we get this new identity. Now we're a brother of Jesus. We're a son of the Father is who we are. And we're made into a new person. Most of you know all that. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Paul says it the most clearly here. And he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. If you're in Christ, remember, walking in Christ, the old's gone, the new is here, the backpack has been emptied out. And that's just one of many places where he explains God's word and God's word to us that the old is gone and it's been eliminated and that's excretion. That's what we're talking about today. The toxic waste is gone. That's the reality of what it means to be in Christ. It's all about grace. It has nothing to do with performance whatsoever. But we got to get rid of the toxins. Wouldn't it be great if we could live in that 24-7? You know, we, we come to worship and we hear the word and, and yeah, we, we, we get in that for a while. And we go, yeah, that's who I am and that's, that's what life is and it's so good to be in Jesus. And, and, you know, it lasts for a while and then somebody throws a rock at us. And we go, oh, I'll take that. Yeah, I knew I was stupid. Yeah, I'll take that back. I knew I was a bad person. Yeah, give me that rock. We put it in our backpack, you know. That's not what's real. What, what, what is it about us that makes us think that punishing ourselves for a lifetime glorifies God? Why, why do we need to do this? Why do we need to punish ourselves? What is it about us that makes us think that being a martyr is a good thing? I, how, does, how does feeling guilty about stuff help anyone? It, how does anger our resentment resolve anything? I mean, well, it's a lie, isn't it? Yeah. Blaming someone else won't heal it. You can be as right as you can be, but, but affixing the blame to someone else is not going to heal the wound. Being a martyr won't help. It's not going to make the relationship any better. Having a pity party for a lifetime is not going to help. You're going to get so you're having the pity party by yourself. Nobody's going to come to your party anymore. None of that stuff does any good. And God says to us, you're a new person. The, you're no longer that old person. That old person's gone. Let it go. Get rid of it. It's toxic. It's waste. That was yesterday. You're in Christ today. Now we see that message about forgetting the past on most of the uh, pop psychology slogans around today. Let it go. Move on. Please don't mix what this, what I'm saying here today with, with that message. Because that message is just a small little part of what I'm saying here. This is not just self-talk. This is not just convincing myself by my sheer will that that stuff is gone. This is a new life that's found only in the person of Jesus Christ. 
Now, the second aspect of this is what we call start, stop. Um, or really, it should be stop, start. Hmm. If, if we never get rid of, of anything in our lives or stop anything, there's no room for anything else. I, I've got a real, this is not a rhetorical question for those of you that are, are thinking about something this afternoon right now. It's, it's come back in here with me, okay? Why, let me ask you a question. I really want an answer. Why do you clean out your garage? Why do you have a garage sale? Why do you clean out your closet? Okay, garage for some of us are closets. Why do you get rid of your old clothes? Okay, Jeremy. No more room. And why do you need more room, Jeremy? All right, I love him. I didn't plant that. He just knew that. All right, you're a quick learner. But that's true, isn't it? We look at our closets and we go, I'm out of space. All I've got is these old clothes. Get rid of these old clothes so I can get some new clothes. All right, ladies, you want to go to shoes? That'll work there, right? I need I, all my shoes are all they're all full. I need some more room here, guys. You know, I, we got to get stuff out of this garage because I need some more tools. Or something. you know, I know that those are gender specific jokes, and I probably shouldn't do that, but it's true. There's only so much that we can have, you know. I got to get rid of it, and then we fill that space up with something else. But the fact remains: that before we can add anything, we have to get rid of something. Before we can start something, we have to stop something. And I think that this is most evident when it comes to the stewardship of time. And I use this word stewardship because steward means that something has been given to us that we're a caretaker for that. There's only so much time in each day, right? Nobody gets any more. We moderns think that we can make more, but, but there really isn't any more. We, we think that we can multitask and, you know, make more time, but they're real, that's another message. But we try. We, we live in the illusion that, if, that I'm more productive and I'm in control of my world because I can multitask and I can actually make time. And Think of it this way. If we were to take a calendar and plot every hour of every day, and we would see the reality of how we have to give something up to begin something else. I mean, you, some of you have that experience. You got calendars that are just packed full of stuff and you look at it and you go, well, I can't do it because I'm full that day, right? So you'd have to eliminate something in your calendar to add something else in. And I just wanted to use this, this example. Uh, suppose, just suppose that, um, and, and I'm a guy, so this is probably a guy, a guy example. That's all right. Uh, I, I can't translate things into girl stuff. I always get into trouble when I try to do that. Um, suppose that you want to learn how to be a good golfer. All right, you're just a hacker right now, and you go out and you lose 10 balls, and people make fun of you, and you take you know four mulligans at each tee. But all of a sudden, you say, I want to be a good golfer. I want to break 80. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to be the kind of guy that breaks 80 all the time. And so you say, well, that's going to take about 10 hours a week. And it would. It'd take probably 10 hours a week for me to become a good golfer. Probably take 10 hours a week for five years, you know, uh, for me. Really, this is true. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, so you say, oh, i got to practice about five hours a week um, because I've got to take some lessons. I've got to hit thousands of golf balls, and then I've got to play one round of golf. And so, you know, I look at my calendar, and I say, Where am, when am I going to do this? And even if it's not written on my calendar, I've got some kind of habit, some activity that's taking up every day. And so I look at my daily activity and I say, well, I gotta, I'm going to give one hour a day to practicing golf during the week. And so I usually get home from work. And what I do when I get home from work is I play video games for an hour. So there goes my video games. I give up video games or I watch TV or I don't know. I scratch the dog's belly for an hour. I, I, whatever you want to put in there, you know. But, but you've got something that you've been doing with that hour every day, so you've got to take that and replace it with golf. And then, then you say, well, and when am I going to get my five hours of a round of golf? When am I going to do that? Well, you know, um, how about Sunday morning? Sunday morning's open. I mean, you're out there with God anyway. Uh, you, you're in nature. and Yeah, and so it's just like worship. Uh, you're out there and you're praying all the time, you know, no slice, no slice and, and stuff like that. And so it's just, just like being in worship anyway. So you take that five hours and, and you know, I've stopped something, going to church, watching video games, scratching the dog's belly, whatever. 
and I've also started something. It's just that simple. Isn't it strange that we try to make life and our priorities so complicated, but actually it's just that simple? That if we want to start something that we have to stop something always, you know? It's, and it's not just about time. Of course, it's, it's about money. <laughs> it's going it's to take, oh, I shouldn't tell this uh, in case there's anybody here, but it takes thousands of dollars, thousands and thousands of dollars to, to play golf well. <laughs> it does. You know, so that money's going to have to come from someplace. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a stop-start kind of thing. Excretion. And that's right where we live. I mean, because if we're living as if we have unlimited time and unlimited resources, we're living in an illusion, and that's not reality. And the reality is, is what we have left when we stop lying to ourselves. I mean, let me say that again. Reality is what we have left when we stop lying to ourselves. That's what's left there. When we say, I don't have time, that's not really true. We've got time. We're just choosing to use it someplace else is what we're choosing to do. We've all got time. Now, Jesus calls this pruning in his illustration of the vine and the branches. And uh, after there is growth and there is production, as we read, then, then uh, the vine dresser prunes the branches so they will grow again. And we've seen bushes that get pruned, you know, and you go, I think they killed it. There's nothing left to grow. There's no way there's ever going to be fruit on that again. There's no way grapes, if you've ever been to a, a vineyard during the wintertime, you go, they killed them all. Look at them. Isn't that sad? All those skeletons out there. And because there's never going to be anything, but, but that's not the way it is. You know, it's the, the practice is necessary. It's, it's taking away so something else can grow there. And, and that's the teaching about repentance. Because you see, repentance is taking away what is old and what is dead so that God might grow something new in us. It's a stop-start. John the Baptist was a cousin of Jesus. Remember, he uh, came before Jesus, preparing the way, and it says that he came saying, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand, among some other things. But... Um, you know, he was saying, stop so you can start. And then Jesus came, and, and Mark 1, 15 is just one of the places where it's recorded. But he said the same thing. He says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Same message. Repent, you know, give something up so you can receive, you know, so you can receive faith. Now, People miss this event about Jesus. We, we get that he was a, uh, a healer and that he met the needs of the people. We get that he's a friend of the sinners. Uh, but, uh, you know, we often forget that he came saying to repent. But that's what he did. He says, stop so you can start something. Make some room for God. He was saying a new way of life is here for you, but you can't receive it unless you give something up. Your old way's got to go before you can have the new way because you can't do both of them at the same time. There's not room in you. There's not room in you for two gods to live. You see? You can't have two masters at the same time. And that's the reality. He's saying, change your direction if you want the kingdom of God, because that's what I'm offering you. Same offering you in, in Matthew, it's called the kingdom of heaven. This is life like heaven's going to be. And that's the pruning operation of God. The Holy Spirit is, is showing people the new life that they can have in the kingdom. And, and God prunes the branches. God speaks to us. Uh, by means of his word and the Holy Spirit. And, and God doesn't bring shame. He doesn't bring guilt. He brings hope. He brings faith to us. You see, conviction is different than what guilt is. A, a guilt is a product of believing the lie that I've done something that's so unforgivable, so unrepairable, you know, that something that I have to carry around with me for the rest of my life. And, and guilt is not from God. Guilt is from the accuser. Guilt is from the enemy of God who, who would have you turn down the kingdom of God because you just don't believe that God can get rid of what you've got 
or that God wants to give you anything else. He tells you that you are who you are and you cannot change, period. Not even God can change you, he says. You have to carry that backpack the rest of your entire life because you deserve it. It's your backpack. You did something to earn that backpack. And you can blame others and you can make excuses, but you can never take it off, he tells you. You are who you are and you can't change. God sends his spirit to us and he's just so gentle and kind to us uh, to give us faith that if we are willing to make some room to clean out the closet, whatever metaphor you want to use, clean out the garage, get the rocks out of the backpack, use the pruning shears, okay, that there's a new kingdom waiting for us, a new life. Now, if you made that step one time, then you know what, what that means. You, you know the joy that comes from that. But it's not a one-time thing. Wouldn't it be great? And there's, there's some people that teach that. It's just one time. You repent once in your life. And, and what you repent of, and this is what they teach. I'm sorry, I'm going off script. What they teach here is that if you repent one time, that you are repenting of everything that you're doing in the future. I'm like, duh. You know, excuse me. How can you repent of something that you haven't done yet? How can you stop something that you haven't started yet? So there are going to be thousands of times in your life where the Holy Spirit comes to you and urges you and says, I've got something more for you if you would just give this up. I want, I want to be in you more. I want you to know more of my power. I want you to know more of my peace. But there's no room here because you filled everything up with all this other junk. You've got to get rid of some stuff. There has to be, you know, there, there has to be some house cleaning. Everyday toxins build up in us. We, we accumulate anger. We accumulate doubt. We accumulate rejection and fear. I mean, really, really to think that we can do everything is a very arrogant, arrogant attitude. And God will empty us in order to to make room for himself in us. He loves us. He's going to empty us. He's going to make room for himself. His word through his spirit will bring conviction to us and we will see that these are toxins in my life and I must get rid of these things in order to give God room. Again, we can we can do nothing on our own as Jesus said. Repentance is at the core of the turning away from our own. A repentance uh, is turning away from our own lordship of our lives and a willingness for everything that exalts itself above Christ to be pruned away. Repentance comes from this abiding in Christ. We're pruned by the Holy Spirit. Now that might be a different way that you've heard repentance before. Well, we always think of repentance to be just tears and anguish and severe regret. But repentance is also a daily stopping and short accounts with God so that we can make room for the Holy Spirit, make room for God in our life. Romans 2.4 is where uh, we go. Uh, Romans 2.4, Paul says to them, he says, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? I love that passage of Scripture. His kindness is what leads us to repentance. Not his anger, not his fear, but God's kindness towards us is what leads us to, to emptying ourselves so that he can take up residence in us. It's not his anger. God has destined you to abide in him, to grow, to produce fruit. And I just simply ask this question today, as I'm sure that the Holy Spirit hopefully has been asking you as we've been going through this whole series, is where do you need to make room? Where is it that you need to make room? I, I can't tell you where that is. Only the Spirit can tell you. The thing that you first think of is, oh, Lord, not that. That's what it is. That, that's a warning to you. If you're thinking, well, anything but that, that's, that's what it is. Because that's the most important thing. It's coming to you right now. And, you know, don't, don't repent out of fear. Don't, don't repent uh, because, uh, you, you know, you're so disgusted in yourself. Repent in faith. Re repent believing that stopping something 
will give room for God to do in your life what you've always dreamed that He wants to do. As deep cries out 